Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2016, brought to you by Infor. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. We're back, Moham RF is here. He's the former CEO of Predictix, a company that was acquired by Infor, now an Infor executive. Moham, welcome to theCUBE, good to Thank see you. Thank you, good to see you guys. So, exciting times, congratulations on the acquisition. Thank you, we're very excited. The team must yeah. be thrilled. You we are, yep. Yeah. So there's a lot to do, uh, but you know, when we started talking about this uh, a year ago now, uh -huh. Uh, we, uh, we wanted to take the time and do it in a way where we knew the team would be highly motivated to continue to realize the vision and where everybody on the team had something to look forward to. You know, if you're an enterprise application developer, you're joining the third largest ERP software company on the planet. If you're into the cloud, you're joining, uh, I think, one of the top 10 AWS uh, customers in, in, in four. If you're into data science, you're joining a company that's created dynamic science labs. Uh, if you're into technology, uh, there's obviously a huge opportunity to get your technology deployed uh, you know, up to, to, up to I think 70,000 enterprise customers. And so there was a lot that we, um, to be excited about, but we took the time to make sure that as we did the transaction, uh, people understood that this is really the beginning and that we were going to be doing some awesome things. In the some, years something for everybody. And, and yeah. Infor made an, uh, an investment in Yes, we started out with an investment. Yeah, we're big uh, believers in what we call do, learn, do. So uh, the idea of trying something in a, in, a, in, a, in a limited way to make sure that it uh, feels right, it, uh, it suits all parties involved. And so uh, we were very supportive of the idea of Infor getting involved in a minimal way initially to see that the growth numbers that we were experiencing in 2015 were, were going to you know, continue and improve in 2016 and to see whether we had the right kind of culture and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we grew uh, our recurring revenues by over 40% uh, in 2015, and uh, at the time of uh, the, the closing of the transaction, we were at, uh, expecting to grow it by at least 60% this year, so. That's an intention getter. Uh, and so take us back to Predictix. Why was the company founded? You know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different reasons. You know, some personal, uh, and some, you know, based on the uh, business opportunity. Basically, I, you know, I've been doing enterprise software for 25 years, and I think enterprise software is generally uh, terrible. <laughs> 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 and uh, I think that this is an opportunity we, to improve it. <laughs> we knew nothing better, but now, now we do. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, you know, just we, we try to rethink it from the perspective of the customer, the retailer, and, you know, both technically, you know, with our early bet on the cloud. We launched in 2009 as the first and only true elastic cloud powered retail merchandising and supply chain solution. Our adoption of advanced technologies like machine learning and uh, you know, integer programming and other predictive and prescriptive uh, analytics. Uh, but also our uh, uh, business model, the way we like to work with retailers, start small, you know, not get uh, them to uh, you know, spend a half a billion dollars and then maybe see a return in two years let us sort of do bite-sized chunks as we discussed you know, in the context of our company and Infor. We call it the do, learn, do methodology where we, we do a little, we deliver, we learn from that experience, then we uh, 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 do some more, then we learn from that experience and we do some more and you're, you're, you're taking the attitude of you don't want perfection to be the enemy of progress and as you iterate very, very, very quickly you get user engagement and you get adoption and you get value. Uh, and so it's just trying to rethink it all uh, and thinking through all the weaknesses of the old model, very one-sided risk, uh, very kind of big bang, uh, huge failure rates, uh, a lot of costs, uh, ongoing and upfront costs, and thinking that there's, there's got to be a much better way of doing really it. Really simplifying and de-risking the whole retail supply chain yep. component yep. of enterprise software it was sort of the raison d'etre, Obviously it worked. You it got, did, you yes. Got, you, you did a little bit, and then now Infor has acquired you. So, so what's that been like? Uh, you, you know, at IBM they call it blue washing. You get, yeah. you get red washed, I mean, it's a lot smaller company, so. No, <laughs> no, it, I think we want to go in the other direction. I think yeah. uh, we want to inject sort of this uh, uh, scrappy DNA into uh, the larger uh, uh, companies. So and I'm sure that's welcome here, yeah. right? I mean, right? I mean, yeah, so we, uh, you know, we, um, 
I think the info retail story is a great one. I think uh, a little over a year ago it was one person. Now if you combine you know, us with some of the other acquisitions and the, the, you look at the team that's focused purely on, uh, on retail, uh, we're talking about over 680 people, okay? So it's, a, it's probably, if not the fastest growing uh, enterprise startup, it's probably in the top three. And uh, the culture around that is very important uh, to keep it sort of uh, uh, agile and fast and fun and, and all of those things. So it's been kind of the other way around. Like uh, our team, um, my portion of the team is about 190 uh, people. Predictix when it was acquired is 190 people. Uh, as part of this transaction, we have uh, 75 info retail uh, developers joining our team, and then we're getting headcount for another 50 or so uh, to grow further. So think about that, uh, and instead of us being broken apart and distributed within info, it's actually we're being kept together as a cohesive unit and me having a whole bunch of info people added to the team and, and, and you know, in the way that, running it in the high growth way that we've been running it. So okay. very excited about that. Earlier we heard that um, retail, uh, we, we always know it's been a low margin in uh, business and laggards and technology adoption. Um, SAP and Oracle put a lot of money and effort into it over a period of a very long time, like in SAP's case, I think already you know, two decades plus. Um, why do you think they've been unsuccessful and how has your um, approach changed? You know, I've, I've been doing uh, enterprise software in the retail context for 25 years. In fact, I was at Retech, which is a company that Oracle bought uh, in 2005, I believe, right? That became the foundation of uh, the uh, Oracle Retail GBU, right? Uh, you know, there are different reasons for different companies, but those companies, in my view, can't uh, create a culture that retains the best talent, that creates the right level of entrepreneurialism, that uh, uh, rewards risk taking, rewards innovation, that cares about uh, you know, the, the user experience and the customer and are interested in the, uh, you know, uh, making uh, this a win-win, right? So it's, like I said, it's a very one-sided way of doing business. And they got to benefit from it because it was them competing with each other, uh, you know, and I, giving the retailer a lesser of two evils choice, okay? Uh, and it's been 25 years since anybody's really invested in doing anything new, you know, or uh, they, um, each of them have solutions that I think go back at least that far. And uh, they've been able to get away with it, right? And so you, uh, you know, if you remember Oracle a few years ago was making fun of the cloud and, you know, Larry getting on stage and talking about wires and servers and what's the cloud, right? Uh, and, you know, we were out there hustling in 2009 as we launched, it was a, a tough, idea to get across, but right around 2014, you could, you could sort of feel it, you know, a, a, a switch flipped, and all of a sudden, uh, Larry was, oh, we're only doing cloud, and uh, SAP was trying to hustle by acquiring their way into the cloud, and uh, it just wasn't, um, uh, it's just not in their DNA, right? So whether it's the tech or the, the process or the business model, they just don't, it just doesn't work in that context. But it's their classic playbook, right? It's yeah. FUD and then and then and then then, yeah. then, then act like you invented. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. yeah. <laughs> so, and it actually works quite well. Yeah. It, you know, the the point is you're you're right on. It's like minimize risk taking because they they don't want to take risks. They want to keep the franchise going. Yeah. And, and so, so I guess the follow up there is what gives you confidence that you can compete with that large estate. Because think about this, as, as uh, Predictix, with 190 people and uh, much lower revenues and infrastructure than Infor has, we beat them head-to-head -head competes, okay? Ugly, brutal uh, competes at three of the uh, world's top, uh, uh, three of the US's uh, uh, top six largest retailers, right? Uh, some of them I can talk about, like the Home Depot, uh, because that's public, but uh, the two others I can't talk about. And these were hotly, hotly contested uh, uh, wins, and they, you know, they brought the, the full, you know, army of people, and we would show up with three or four people, and we knew what we were talking about, and we offered a much lower risk model, and we had uh, the track record, and we had the cloud momentum, and we had the machine learning momentum. Uh, it's devastating when you know they bring uh, a division of people, and you know, three guys can uh, can beat them. If you can't beat them, buy them. George. <laughs> <laughs> you know, You've told us you have a long history in enterprise software. Yeah. You probably, you must remember 
the alliance and then war between I2 Technologies and SAP, yep. where it turns out that the analytics could be deployed first for the higher return, or That's so, correct. Yep. so customers told yep. um, I2, and I2 said, so go ahead and do us before SAP. Right. Is the same thing happening with your analytics versus the broader retail transactional systems? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting trend here. So the analytics are the high value solutions, right? They're the move the needle solution. With one of our clients, for example, we were able to help them uh, reduce inventory from uh, 5.5 uh, billion dollars worth of inventory down to four. Now we don't take credit for all of that, but they would give us credit uh, for at least 150 million of that, okay? And that bulk of that benefit comes from being able to predict you know, what will happen when you're promoting product, for example, more accurately than uh, you were doing before. And that's a really interesting story that I'd love to tell you about because the cloud was a key enabling, uh, cloud and machine learning uh, uh, was, was key to being able to do that better, right? Uh, uh, but the, uh, <clears throat> you've got to start with the analytics to get the value and you release $150 million worth of value in the enterprise that then funds other things. And the cool thing about what we're doing here at Infor is we're going in a direction where we're not going to do what SAP and Oracle and others have done historically where you have a layer of technology for the transactional pieces and a layer of transactions for the BI, uh, technology for the BI pieces and a layer of technology for the planning pieces. The, the planning solution that you deliver to get the high uh, benefit it is the is the platform that we would use to deliver the execution capability and the transactional capability and so on. So that's very different from the way things worked 25 years ago where you had to have an OLTP layer and an OLAP layer and a BI layer and all that kind of stuff. This is really critical for, ex for potentially for explaining how the software industry is going to unfold. If I uh, repeat what you just said, trying to make sure I'm in my own language, I, I understand yep. it. You're saying, we start with the analytics, we source the data that we need from whatever systems, which are going to be different by customer, right. and then we have an operational, we have a process for operationalizing it That's back right. into the existing, right. existing uh, transactional right. system, which again is different from customer to customer. That's correct, and, and you can then replace the transactional system because the analytics become the interface into the process, right? So if I'm pricing, uh, I don't want you know, an old you know, fashioned form where I'm doing everything by hand. I want an analytical solution with a modern uh, user experience, a smart user experience, and then, that, that, you know, then it stops mattering what is doing the execution and whether it's some legacy uh, piece of software or whether then we just turn that off and replace that with our own execution capability that's built into our analytics, then you're, you're done. Okay, yeah. so help, help me understand how that differs from, let's say, an Oracle approach or an SAP approach. An Oracle approach might be you sort of filter the data and then shove it into exadata, right. perhaps. Uh, SAP, you know, the answer is HANA. Right. So uh, it's, talk it's, about those solutions versus your approach it, and... So it's, it's closer, uh, if I had to say yeah. one, one approach was closer to ours, I would say SAP with sure. HANA because it's the whole uh, uh, rethinking the stack around hybrid transaction analytical processing, okay? And so yep. SAP has made a big bet on HANA and is rewriting everything on HANA and trying to bring transactions and analytics in one place. Uh, I think Oracle's story is a lot weaker. Obviously, Exadata is very interesting technology and the whole sort of uh, engineered stack, but it's very much a database story. If you actually look at the reality of how their applications are architected, right, the Oracle applications that they're selling for ERP today still have major components of them written in Oracle forms. They haven't even made the transition to Java, right? Uh, not to mention making the transition to some kind of hybrid technology that has BI and planning built in. So in the Oracle, retail world, it's uh, uh, everything maybe might run on Exadata, but the, the RMS or the uh, uh, ERP application is very, very different from the BI application, which looks, uh, you know, ER, uh, ERP is about what's going in my business today. Uh, the BI layer is what happened over the last three or four years. And then of course the planning stack is completely different uh, uh, again. And if you add predictive analytics and you add prescriptive analytics, you're talking about five or six different stacks that are not coherent. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't realize that it wasn't written in Java. I thought, you know, I just took Larry at his word, 100% oh, Java. Yeah. You, you should double uh, check. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, so but what you've described and what you've accomplished is very difficult 
because you know you, uh, George, I, I wasn't at Hadoop Summit and all the Hadoop shows that you do, but <clears throat> the big data guys struggle. C customers struggle with all the complexity. Um, they struggle with lack of domain expertise, you know, lack of, of data science capability. Somehow you've put all that together, you built a very successful business. Yeah. Why do you think you were able to do that? The cloud was part of it. Maybe you just use the cloud data pipeline and that has simplified no, things, but. Cloud is just part of it, right? But, but cloud is a key part of it. And another difference is engineering purely for the cloud, right? So imagine, you know, go back to the early 90s since you guys know that era. Uh, the people who were trying to be both on Unix and Oracle and on the S400 and on the mainframe and, 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 they didn't make it, okay? Uh, and even though in the early 90s, maybe the mainframe business was bigger than the, uh, uh, than the uh, you know, uh, sure. client server business, right? So what we see here, again, you see it with SAP and Oracle, it's a kind of like, I'm, I'm better because I'm both, okay? But let's come back to that example I used earlier about $150 million worth of benefit based on a bit more accurate analytics for a promo promotional analytics. When we, we had to compete for that business and we got a shot at doing the work and, and then so did three or four other very large companies, I won't name them, okay? And we all got the same data and we were all asked to make the same predictions, okay? And we, our, our uh, uh, predictions were, had at least 25% less error than the next best guy, okay? Why is that? They have engineers, we have engineers, they have uh, computer scientists, we have computer scientists, but they engineered the solutions to work this on premise and on the cloud. We were not constrained by on-premise, so we can ask Amazon, and we do ask Amazon, every weekend for 10,000 computing cores on behalf of our customer. 10,000 cores at less than 10 cents a core hour, that's less than 1,000 bucks for a 10,000 CPU machine, okay? We can then use that monster machine, okay, that normally, you know, in the old days, you had to be the NSA to own, okay, for 10 hours, let's say, to do this very sophisticated machine learning where we, very advanced math, very large data sets, and then we give that up, okay? So, uh, 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 the other guys can't assume that, uh, they, that the retailer will buy a 10,000 core machine and have it sit around uh, doing nothing most of the week, and therefore they'll engineer the software that has to work on premise for the lowest common denominator. And the lowest common denominator might have 16 cores in it, 32 cores. If you really want to kind of you know go crazy, 64 cores. It's a totally different uh, uh, mindset. And so if you unshackle yourself and you say, I'm just doing it on the cloud, you can do that you can exploit the elasticity of the cloud to do analytics and to do all sorts of things that other guys can't do. I love this conversation because you know, we do a lot of these events and on the one end of the spectrum you got Andy Jassy who said, no, everything's going to the cloud. And the other end of the spectrum you have all the enterprise guys said, no, it's hybrid, same, same, most of the world's going to be on-prem. You know, et cetera, et cetera, but from a- I love that they think that, let them keep thinking. Well, but you know- I feel bad actually, I'm giving our secrets away. So. I, you, know, <laughs> you know, the old adage, well, you're both right. They can't both be right, <laughs> so, right? Yeah. In this case, they can't yeah. both be right. And yeah. you look at the momentum that Amazon has and, yeah. and, and the marginal economics it, and the efficiencies and- Let me give you one more example. I, I find I'm, I'm, I'm passionate on this point. I remember the old days, you were, again, we we're all old enough to remember Lotus 1, 2, 3 and how dominant it was. On DOS, I mean, you couldn't imagine a world without Lotus One, Two, Three. Everybody I worked was, there. You worked yeah, there, yeah, even. Yeah. I started. That was my <laughs> first job out of college. Yeah, completely dominant. You know, Windows comes along, and uh, Lotus One, Two, Three actually runs on Windows. Okay, it just runs as a character mode app. It doesn't take advantage of the native capability of this new platform, which is a GUI, right? Yeah. Right? Oh, and yeah. so, so taking a client server app and just running it on Amazon is kind of like taking Lotus One, Two, Three as a character mode app and having it run on Windows. It still sucks. Uh, and it doesn't take advantage of that capability. So. Even, even worse, when, when Microsoft started competing with, with Lotus, with Excel, Lotus decided when Windows first came out, we're not going to support Excel. We're going to support OS2, we're going to support VMS. We're going to support Windows, yeah. Oh, so Windows, I said, yeah. Windows. Yeah. We're not going to support Windows, we're going to support uh, OS2. Yeah, winning uh, choices uh, there. VMS, <laughs> right, and then eventually. And MVS, came also, out. the main thing. Yeah, I didn't know about MVS. Yeah, we did. Right, so they felt, you know, we had more power as the application, yeah. but the perfect example of the marginal economics of volume. Yeah, so you, um, if you don't make the right platform choice, or you try to hedge, right? It's expensive and yeah. it's, uh, you fork your, yeah, your you effort. you don't know who you are yeah. anymore, right? But it's going to be interesting to watch that play out. All right, Mohan, we give you the last word. Um, Inforum in 2016, some takeaways for our audience? 
No, yes, it's week number two. We're very excited to be part of the yeah. team. Uh, and uh, really excited to be part of Inforum. This is actually my second Inforum. We got to know uh, Infor over, uh, over a period of time. Uh, we had a shared client in, uh, in Whole Foods. And so really excited about what Charles and Duncan and the team is doing here, and we're very, very happy to be part of it. Yeah, Whole Foods up on stage today. Great, great case study, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, thanks very much again. Congratulations on the acquisition, and Thank good luck. You. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back to wrap up day one. This is day one of two-day coverage, wall-to-wall -wall from the Javits Center. Inform 2016, right back. <laughs>